Today, we have two female founders who are really changing the space of sustainable businesses, whether that's in the service sector, sector or in the retail sector of fashion. They are Tamsin Chislett, who is the co-founder of On Loan, and they are also Jennifer Conway, the founder of Ava Mosso. And I will be telling you more about both of those brands and also they will be telling you more themselves. Um, before we go any further, I just wanted to tell you about our sponsor. It really wouldn't be possible without them. They are Clavio, that's spelled K-L-A-V-I-Y-O an e-commerce marketing platform for brands of all types, shapes, and sizes from 111 Skin, and then to name some of our members who use them, Hayley Menzers, I know loves them, um, mm -hmm. Hummingbird Bakery. So they really, for us as well, I can say for Fashmash have been transformative. We moved all of our email marketing over to them coming up to I think about eight months ago now and they provide a just really one-on-one -on -one customer service and then really great insights and very precision targeting so it's been fantastic to be able to start using them as well if you would like to give them a go yourself go to clavio.com forward slash fashmash and you can start a free trial today um at the start of 2021 of course with the backdrop of the pandemic or um, the backdrop of yet another lockdown that we were all facing, we held one of our focus roundtables, as we have been doing since the beginning of COVID, dedicated to small businesses. Now, this was a really, really interesting discussion. It was one of our favourites of the year, I think, mm -hmm. and or the whole series, actually. Um, and we found that um, it led to so many great connections for those founders that were in attendance that we decided we would repeat it again just over halfway through the year um, with a different group of members. Um, on this occasion, everyone that participated was from a sustainable business or sustainable focused company. Um, you know, some of them being product driven and some of them being more service focused. Um, so quite different in their approach and all of them coming from, of course, fashion. Needless to say, lots of the same topics came up as we yeah. saw back in January. It was things like dealing with COVID and all of the challenges that her, that, that has brought up, um, figuring out the complexities of Brexit and what that has meant for both trading in Europe and, of course, producing from Europe as well. Um, we also explored growth opportunities and what that has looked like in the context of owning a sustainable company and the sometimes contradiction that those two things present. Mm. Um, and then we talked about investment quite a lot as well and how quickly that landscape seems to be evolving, even in the past 12 months, which is really promising and quite exciting. So another thing that came up was marketing and PR. Um, interestingly, all of the founders first of all shared one thing in common, which I delved into a little more depth for and, and was fascinated to, to find out. Basically, in April, there was development in the Apple store. Anyone who downloaded the iOS 14.5 software <laughs> Uh, was faced with a conundrum, and I'm sure all of you who are iPhone users have been seeing it. Open an app that you haven't used for a while, or when you download a new app, you are faced with a conundrum and you have to decide. Specifically, they ask every time, would you like this app to allow you to track your activity across other companies and websites? Now, mm -hmm. this is Apple's identifier for advertisers. Um, specifically, it's called Apple's app tracking transparency. And because of this development, advertisers are less able to serve personalized adverts to us. Now, a lot of people might find those slightly stalkerish adverts a real pain, but actually for small businesses, it has been integral to their success. And very interestingly, all the founders said there was a real lull in the success of their Facebook advertising, and that includes Instagram, ever since this app development, or rather this software development and, and this new privacy rule. Um, bearing in mind that Facebook advertising is already a pay to play, pay, a pay to play area and arena. Yeah. And it's not like it was a few years ago. Most small brands are starting to be priced out of it. This is another game changer to that space. And they're needing to think of more agile ways to market their small business. This idea of the founder needing to be the face of the brand, how much presence should they have? That pressure that a founder feels, particularly a female founder. Um, it's, it's a conundrum, should they put their face out there? You know, for me, I think there is, there's also been this step change. We've spoken about it before on these lives. 
since the pandemic, there is this need for community. It's the buzzword now more than ever. Um, there's also this idea that the customer has a trust instilled in them if they get to see the faces behind the brand. It gives brands personality. And that's what brands of all shapes and sizes in the last year have really been trying. You know, they're trying to get empathy. <laughs> it's a key way to do that. But the pressure to be Instagram ready for a founder, of, for an entrepreneur who is also trying to think about their cash flow, think about their P&L, think about paying their staff um, production, it, it must be so intense. And I really think that there are kind of these two sides to the coin here. Yeah. Um, interestingly, all of the founders on our call did not name their brands eponymously. All of their brands didn't have their name. And in some ways, I can imagine that there's huge benefit to that fair anonymity, you know, when it comes to investors, that could be quite transferable. But equally, does an investor really value a PR worthy, known, always in the press face of a brand? Um, Rachel, what do you think? Yeah, I found this such a fascinating discussion. Because I think when you stop and think at the moment, you know, immediately off the top of your head for the sake of today's conversation, thinking about sustainable businesses, sustainable brands, social media fronted brands, etc. Really, it is those that have a face for them that I think stand out the most, but it must, mm. there's also, we're probably a little bit biased here because I think it's also probably coupled with the fact that those that put their face forward the most are also the ones that are currently getting the most PR. Yeah. Uh, I think that probably ties back to, as you say, that trend around that community piece and wanting that sort of sense of personality or, or sort of, um, yeah, just personal emotional attachment to things currently given everything that we've been going through. So yeah. um, it's really interesting. I mean, it's also not completely brand new. If you think about it, like traditionally a luxury house was named after the founder and would typically have always had a face attached to them and then that was that would even be passed down obviously to the creative directors and so forth who have continued in the majority of cases obviously there are many brands that don't have that example but there are still a lot where that really is the case um where they're sort of still front and center but i do think it's changing and i do think we're seeing more of this sort of surreptitious type if you will for want of a better phrase um just sort of coming coming out and doing 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 quite well and it's fascinating to hear some of the thoughts behind it I mean you know as you say there's there's the, all the hassle of it you know actually managing that when you're also trying to do your job there's also just the people that just genuinely don't want to be the face of something yeah that's not why they've gone into business to sort of it's not about them you know it's about obviously what, what they're trying to do um and I think what you, the point that you've made there that's really interesting is about the end game and like what is actually the reason for being in business and, and and sort of what you're ultimately trying to achieve um and and it's really interesting that everybody on our round table had not named their own um the brand over after after themselves um by their own moniker and if, if you say if you're looking through that lens of what the sort of if there's a sales goal at the end if you're trying to ultimately um have an acquisition of your company mm. does a profile help with that and i think you're right you can absolutely argue that in both directions you know it, it definitely helps with driving investors we've we, we've seen that already in terms of for, for the for the immediate you know they like that very pr worthy story and that is definitely what's trending right now you know that yeah. is a, a trendable story if you will especially on sustainability um but i do also really believe that there's a big big benefit in being able to disconnect from it and sell it onwards um without that sort of risk there of being um you know of it sort of floundering because it no longer has the founders the name of the founder actually being being part of it um i do think there's some interesting examples that we've seen outside of fashion as well i think Bumble is a really good example um, of quite a healthy balance between the two things. Um, it's obviously IPO'd now, but if you think about the founder, Whitney Wolf Hurd, she is the face of it. But it also, I don't think, and I may be proven completely wrong, but I don't think it gives the impression that the company is going to suffer if she steps back. Completely. Because that brand has done so well and it's not actually, mm. been, it's not her name that's the mm. front. She's so sort of integral to it. I think the other really interesting point raised, and even the example I've given there, it's always female female founders that we're talking about here. That's the challenge. We we don't really see it with men. I, 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 well, that was one thing we talked but about. The other day, for but for me, it coincides with girl boss culture. Because, yeah. And as the last year has proven, the 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 weaknesses of that as a culture and the kind of 
phoniness of it. Mm. Um, because if you think back about 10, 15 years ago, it wasn't considered uh, taking fashion. It wasn't a considered a necessity to have this face. Um, and, you know, yeah. social media wasn't around. So you weren't expected to front, you know, be the uh, everything from like the in-house model to the to the customer service rep on your DMs that is expected yeah. now. Um, it was really judged on the product. That's true. So even if you were Coco Chanel and you really were the face of the brand, that's probably quite a lot in retrospect because obviously back then with no social media, it wouldn't have been anything like, you know, it wouldn't yeah, have been a personal life as much as we, we obviously read the stories about it now. Um, I mean, you know, we were an all female group, so perhaps we were a little bit biased. Yeah. Um, but I do really struggle to think of a young fashion business with a dominant male face to it. And by that, I mean a sort of a startup level. Mm -hmm. I know there are lots of male creative directors, but um, yeah. A really interesting one. But anyway, on that note, we should, we should bring on our two female founders. We absolutely should. I think both of you can introduce yourselves far better than I ever could. Um, Tamsin, I was just starting to introduce the concept of on loan. Could you tell us a little bit more about it and maybe a little bit more about your role there? So on loan, we are a um, fashion rental and resale membership. So we partner directly with the best contemporary designers around and make their fashion accessible on a monthly membership um, to loan when you want to loan them and send back when you don't. Um, my role is co-founder and CEO. So I work alongside um, the fabulous Natalie Hasek, who is the creative director. And we've been building this business for the last couple of years. That was beautifully put and so much better than I could, I, as I knew it would be. Um, Jennifer, could you do the same please for Evermoso? So I'm Jenny Conway and I'm the founder of Evermoso and we are a sustainable athleisure activewear brand. Uh, we launched in February 2019. Uh, our whole ethos is we're trying to make sustainably sourced clothing the new norm. And that has evolved with, I guess, the last couple of years where we're, so, we're now trying to design with end of life in mind. We're trying to now also look at the circularity of all our pieces and trying to be a bit more conscious of, of how we express that. Um, but all our, all our pieces are basically made from recycled elastane, econel, tensile, organic cotton. Um, and it's all about sort of conscious consumption and, uh, and a slow fashion uh, collection. So we're not churning out the pieces. Uh, uh, so it's conscious. And um, when we feel that our community feel that they want something new, then we're very responsive in, in that sense. That was that was all music to my ears, and I know it will be to the fashion mash communities too. It's these these are ethoses that I know are very important to to all at the moment. Um, so I'd like to begin just with a bit of a twenty twenty one in review. We're about to hit the ninth month. How has it been for each of you? What are the hurdles as entrepreneurs that you have confronted this year? Uh, uh, Tamsin, should we go to you first? <laughs> sure. Um, so I, I won't lie, it definitely started pretty badly. Um, you know, January and February were really tough. Like I think they were for so many entrepreneurs who were running businesses, which the pandemic negatively affected. You know, rental is a tough sell when you're not leaving the house and kind of quite rightly so. Um, so by January and February, we had, you know, plowed our way through 10 months of a really unfavorable market. Um, and we're pretty drained um, and fed up by that point and, um, and just desperate for it to be over. And so um, since then, since March, it's just been astonishing how much it's turned around and how much more fun it's been. So, um, you know, as soon as lockdown started easing, the business started growing really fast. We had a lot of latent demand. I think people who had bookmarked us to try once they were allowed out the house again. And, um, and it's been a blazing kind of spring summer. Actually, our main hurdle right now is that we've, we've sort of run out of stock. Um, we've, we've been adjusting that in the last few weeks, which has been good, but that was definitely the main hurdle of the summer, which is, um, sounds like the, the best problem to have, but we're still tricky, <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> it, it must be hard to judge because you're going from naught to 60, aren't you? I mean, what a year. Um, Jenny, how about you? Yeah, I think, in in, in some respects, quite similar, but uh, probably on a different scale. I think we obviously at the beginning of lockdown was you know, everyone living in leggings. Um, either that meant choosing your own leggings or also then thinking, OK, so if I'm actually going to be working in them as well as exercising in them and not going anywhere, I may as well choose some some uh, some leggings that I really want to wear. So we did see an uplift uh, at the beginning. 
Uh, and then slowly but surely, I mean, I'll be very honest, you know, I, I had a kid, uh, I had a baby a year ago, uh, and obviously some of you are, are mamas as well. And, you know, that's been a challenge. And I think it's trying to have that constant balance between running a business, um, raising a baby, and then also trying to understand the changing market, uh, resources, money, um, all, all the fun things like that. So it's been, it, it was good, then it was slow during to sort of now the beginning of summer and now it's more that we're, we're starting to pick up a bit in terms of our activity and we've got exciting things in the pipeline in terms of partnerships and uh, a campaign that we'll be launching soon with uh, potential new pieces that we're coming out with so it's 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 on the upcline and it's, it's it's exciting as I'm starting to get a grasp of the business again and, and yeah. I feel like I'm out of that haziness of, of early motherhood and actually, we'll have questions at the end, but I've just seen one that's come up immediately for you, Jenny. Um, yeah. Premier Magazine asks, are, pro are your products for sale in traditional retail outlets or are you DC? DC. <laughs> yeah. So we, we chose, uh, basically, we, are, we have an online shop and we do primarily just shop through our website. We do have some retailers, uh, one in Holland, uh, Schoon. Uh, and then also we did a little bit with Wolf and Badger, which was amazing. Um, but we've sort of taken uh, the approach at the moment, just, it's good, but I think we're just not a wholesale business at, at, at the minute. Um, but it's something we'd love to potentially look at. But yeah, we, we are direct to consumer at the, at the, at the moment. Uh, and that is true of, of many yeah. brands of your age and, and, and size. So, so nothing wrong yeah. with that, yeah. particularly in view of sustainability. Um, let's let's take a look at the invest and, and Rachel. I'm dominating, so do chip in if it's all as well. Like oh, so this is great. <laughs> you, um, the investment landscape. Tamsin, I know actually you've had experience in this, particularly because um one of our guests on the call was saying that you advised her so brilliantly on when she was starting to consider that. Um, what what's your take on the investment landscape right now for for entrepreneurs? I think for, for sustainable fashion, it's pretty hot, to be honest. I think um, I think it was really tough during the pandemic. I mean, it was, as I say, for rental fashion, for, for most categories, it was just a really tough market and, and also just a lot of unknown. So, you know, we were talking to investors at the beginning of the year and that was a tricky conversation coming out of the pandemic. But going back to them now, I think there's been some real success stories recently. You're seeing, you know, the likes of Bestia Collective and others raising significant yeah. amounts of money. Um, you know, Depop being sold um, is a huge exit that kind of proves that you can get to the end. Um, and people are starting to see the shift in consumer behavior. And so for sustainable fashion brands, I think actually the market's hotting up a lot, which is which is good and really good to hear. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. Really yeah. Oh, <laughs> Rachel Jinks, I think we just said exactly the same thing, but it's, it's promising and it, it's deserved. Um, Tamsin, what would your tips be in light of particularly the fact that you've already given one of our members advice on the call? What would your tips be for um, entrepreneurs looking to, to go for investment? Yeah, I'm going to say all the tips out loud and then they're basically to remind myself to do it as much as anything else. But um, I, mean, I think the key thing that we, we've learned is, and been advised on is just running a really tight process. It's right. so easy for fundraising to take over your life. And it's really grueling, no matter how hot a business you are, how well you're doing, it is, it is tough. Um, yeah. Because you essentially have to take on a whole nother day job alongside your normal job. And, you know, I'm also juggling a young family, same as you. Yeah. It's, you know, we're already at max capacity and then you throw that in the mix. Um, and so the best advice we had was kind of set a very clear deadline that you're going to raise to and make that known and work towards that and make sure everyone else works towards that. And, um, and it just really helps you not let the whole thing kind of slip between your fingers and, um, and get away with you. And you, the other thing is to um, keep checking in with your team. And, you know, in my case, I'm lucky enough to have a co-founder. I realize not everybody is. But it is, um, it's just a really good time to kind of make sure that you're keeping each other sane and taking time out and celebrating the wins and all of that stuff. Because, you know, it is a, it's, a, it's a big thing to raise money. Can yeah. I ask a question to, to Tamsin? Please, <laughs> I'd love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just in terms of at what point did you realize that you, you, you decided that seeking investment was the right avenue for you instead of just doing perhaps crowdfunding or doing another round of family and friends or you know at what point did you think you know what I think this is now this is now right. the, the time we're ready yeah 
Yeah, um, I wouldn't even say just crowdfunding, by the way, because I think crowdfunding is really, yeah. really tough <laughs> as well. Um, I think for us, I mean, we, you know, we, we always knew we had really big ambitions for our loan and we knew it would take external capital to get there. Um, so it was definitely a moment of when rather than if. Um, and then it was about, you know, we raised our first round of money pre-pandemic. So it was about, you know, noticing that we had demand that we could go out and meet if we only had the resources to do it. Um, right. I think we... We hustled a lot. I built a terrible website. We had, um, you know, we sort of blagged our way through our first few designer meetings. We, um, we, you know, pretended we had a lot more cash than we had probably at times. Yeah. It's sort of the game you have to play. Um, and then that meant that we'd built up a community who were ready to rent. And so we could go to investors and say, look, like we know we can grow the business to X or we need the capital to do it. And, and that felt like the right kind of time. Um, and then you meet that point again, right? So, we're, you know, we're basically getting there now again where, the growth is there and great, but to take it to the next level, we probably need some more external capital. Cool, good to know. <laughs> Jennifer, I actually was gonna put that question to you, but I think the way you've just asked Tamsin, I think that's, that's far better than, than me as chair, so thank you. Yeah, um, no worries. I, I would love now, you probably already heard me and Rachel starting to delve into this concept, which actually all four of us on the call confront of, being the face of your company, how much is too much, um, how much is beneficial. We would just love for you to share your thoughts on this. Jennifer, perhaps if you could go first, what's the response from your community when you do choose to share your face, your story? It's, a, it's really interesting because I think after we got off um, and I listened actually Tamsin to what you were saying, it, it's something I hadn't really sat down and thought about in terms of why aren't guys doing this? Why aren't male founded businesses doing it the way that we seem to do it so much more in a, a female founded business? Mm. The, the reality is, is that when I post uh, and tell a little bit about the truths of what I'm up to as the founder of the company and perhaps show a picture of myself and talk and delve maybe a bit deeper into some of the the truths or what's been going on. It seems to get the best uh, reaction and it, it's, it's the best engagement. And, and that's the question that you guys were discussing. Is it to do with the trust? Do people maybe like the fact that they see a woman talking about, you know, she set up this business, she's talking about these struggles with her child or whatever it may be. And, it's relatable perhaps. So I have found that it is sometimes beneficial, but it is a fine line and it is a balance. And I can understand that perhaps once you get to the investment <laughs> phase, it's, it's perhaps, you know, it's not scalable. Um, and I think that would be something which I don't mind putting myself in front of the brand every so often, but I'd love to build a team and I'd love to talk about the other women who are behind the brand. And that would be, also an important thing but I, I do think it's a very fine balance and mm. I know that it works well but it's also it makes me sometimes feel a bit like oh why aren't guys doing it you know why why are you know all these awesome brands not doing it as much and maybe it's because women like seeing other women and maybe uh, that's kind of the way it is maybe it's not sexist maybe it's actually how we seem to feel that we relate to other brands but I'm not sure I love the, what you said there, actually. You know, we do, Rachel and I were actually discussing this this morning when we had our meeting. Um, you do love to, there, there is that sense of aspiration. It is wonderful to see a success story as a woman, um, particularly because the benefits of girl boss culture, which we were discussing earlier, have transpor transformed, I think, ambition for the generation so much. Um, but it is a fine line. And it is, I can imagine hugely pressurizing when also trying to run a fashion business, which neither Rachel and I do. I, I did in, in the past in my previous role as, as business director and it's intense. And yeah. I just, I keep always saying cash flow whenever I think about it, but that model for <laughs> yeah. tough. Um, Tamsin, if we, if we turn to you, um, what are your thoughts on it from, from a media perspective? Um, yeah, and, and I suppose also as a, as a co-founder, do you both align on this? Yeah, I'm smiling because I know that our comms director is or will tune in and she'll be grinning because <laughs> she, um, you know, she, she absolutely wants us to have a higher profile and is constantly explaining to us why it's so important. And I know she's right um, from, a, from a PR point of view. You know, you do get more coverage and you do get a, a bigger voice for the business, especially in the early days before the business is really talking for itself mm. in lots of other ways. Mm. Um, 
I, I think my co-founder and I are sort of deeply uncomfortable with being the face of the brand, if I'm honest. We, you know, we both, yeah, I can see it. My, my comms director piping up saying, yes, do more. Um, Natalie and I are both really uncomfortable with it. I, you know, I could actually do this sort of thing endlessly. I love to talk the entrepreneurial side and the business side mm. and, um, and, you know, get the, get the word out about how difficult but wonderful it is being a founder slash female founder. Um, the bit I find harder is particularly in fashion, the sort of pressure for it to be about... Mm. Um, you know, I guess aesthetics and mm. being seen in a dress, which is just not my, you know, not my vibe at all to take a selfie or something. Um, and I really, that's a bit where I really do worry that it is a pressure on female founders that isn't found amongst male founders. You know, the founder of Farfetch is not known for what he wears. He's known for building an extraordinary business. And that's what I aspire to replicate as opposed mm. to, um, you know, it being, being about my Instagram profile. But I say all that knowing that I love it as well. That's the irony. Yeah. I follow lots of female entrepreneurs on Instagram and I absolutely adore hearing what they're up to. And that's always mixed in with the aesthetic side. And so um, I'm being very hypocritical, if I'm honest. <laughs> but maybe that's the point, right? Maybe that's the idea is that it's kind of a new thing. So maybe we're kind of trying to see how do we feel? Do we feel comfortable in it? And maybe it's not a one size fits all. Maybe it is a little bit of, this this type of brand can maybe do it based on their aesthetic and maybe maybe it's not for every brand and maybe that's the allure of it that that some brands do do it and other brands maybe don't I don't know yeah I do I do think that's true and I also um I also often wonder if I was still in my 20s and didn't have a family and like yeah. generally looked presentable at most times but it's partly uh, you know partly an age like oh, I don't think I can do this at this point yes <laughs> it's funny that there is this instant everybody instantly turns to Instagram when actually as an entrepreneur, it's LinkedIn that should be the platform. Mm. You literally take the words out of my mouth. Is it? <laughs> we are one brain. Um, yeah, sorry about this, everyone. It, what I was going to say is it, it's so fascinating to think about that pressure from an aesthetic standpoint, and feeling that sort of sense of, oh, I don't know, but I don't want to put myself out like, because I yeah. feel like I'm obviously in a completely different context, even outside of fashion, match, just as, through the lens of kind of self-promotion for the for the work I do in sustainable fashion and feeling very uncomfortable as well with that self-promotion standpoint and the sort of imposter syndrome that goes with it mm. and I think it gets a certain size I love what you said about this notion of the company sort of speaking for itself it's kind of different but in that early stages you've got that that thing but I but I do agree LinkedIn it's totally different but then it's to your point Tamlin because you're just talking through that business lens aren't you so there isn't that then of having to also couple with that with you personally which I think there is that expectation around Instagram and sort of mm. Instagram I guess being the supposed platform for a consumer that people want to see that through yeah. but I'm, I also enjoy it from other people I mean I guess it'd be, it'd be lovely to hear from you guys in terms of like what's next you know where you sort of headed whether it's through this lens of what we've been talking about here or or just more broadly as we move into well I was about to say it's half of 2021 but we're well into that now <laughs> unbelievably it's nearly September you know what I mean Q4 <laughs> <laughs> yeah I think I don't mind starting yeah I think um it's really exciting now I find that like you were saying, I think, Rosanna, on, on maybe our round table, just the fact that, you know, sustainability and sustainable fashion does have this allure to it. And it's kind of it's kind of fashionable and everyone's kind of getting on it. So in some respects, it's great. Um, but it's also now this is the platform to now start talking about all these exciting things that are going on. Uh, and for us, we're sort of taking the viewpoint that it's not so much about producing more, but we want to try and get people excited about the things that we're doing. So we're about to launch a take back scheme with a fantastic company called Reskinned. And they are partnering up with lots, lots bigger brands uh, like Finisterre. Uh, but we've also sort of piggybacked on them and uh, we'll be doing a sort of a take back scheme where all of our customers can send back their pieces. Um, and it basically is trying to help with the circularity of our pieces. And then they, they will get recycled either mechanically uh, or chemically recycled back into other uses and other products. And the aim is then for us now with future in the future in mind, we will be designing with the end of life in mind. So our future designs, we will be considering how the end of life 
uh, looks like. So the trouble is obviously with an activewear brand, there's elastane. And that's something which we are trying to understand. Is longevity and durability the main point or can we try and recycle it? So um, I won't dabble on too much of it, but we're looking at these exciting things instead of potentially uh, putting a whole new collection. We will potentially be launching uh, some new pieces, uh, maybe a new t-shirt, uh, but I won't say too much quite yet because we're still trying to <laughs> figure it all out. Exciting. And, and do, I should also say, a little Fash Mash promo, do check out our pioneered speaker of last month, one of the co-founders and the chief innovation officer of Pangaea, who mentioned this exact conversation, the Elastane conundrum. Yeah. Um, Tamsin, how about you? Yeah, we've got um, a really exciting few months ahead. I mean, we're just so happy to be in full growth mode, to everyone be out and about enjoying themselves. Fashion rental is kind of back and booming in a big way. I'm sure you'll, you know, you can see that from all of the rental businesses out there. We are bringing on um, some more really exciting designers. We just launched Regina Pio, which was huge for us, and um, and have a couple more fantastic ones in the works. Um, doubling down on our tech so there's lots to build to kind of build that really really <coughs> amazing service for our customers and then a lot of community building and particularly excited about finally taking some stuff offline um you know which we haven't been allowed to do for so long or at least not in the way we'd like to and so um it's going to be a sort of q4 of really meeting our customers in real life which i cannot wait for that's so great we're feeling the same at fash mash we did a, a very mm -hmm. special about a month ago and we're, we're hopefully looking forward to doing some of our speaker series IRL too so yeah um thank you for sharing your next steps um Rachel do you have anything to add or shall we wrap for today yeah no this has been wonderful thank you so much for sharing all your insights thank you it's been so us. cool yeah <laughs> it's been awesome your... Thank you. And a final thank you to our sponsor, Clavio, as well. Um, everybody, we will be back next month. We've got some really exciting speakers to announce. So please do um, sign up for our email if you have not already. See you soon.